And I'm happy to welcome all of you uh, to this event, whether you're joining us in person or uh, virtually. Um, if you are not familiar with the Massachusetts Historical Society, uh, we are the first historical society in America with our founding dating back to the very beginning of the Republic in 1791. Uh, we are an independent nonprofit organization that maintains research, a research library uh, that provides access to a remarkable collection of manuscripts, uh, including the papers of three U.S. presidents, as well as soldiers, mothers, poets, and protesters. We also host a wide variety of programs on topics related to, the Mass to Massachusetts and American history for both uh, general and academic audiences. Uh, tonight, we're uh, kicking off our second program in a three program series. Uh, looking back at two years of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are only able to produce programs like this and provide access to our collections uh, thanks to the support of our members and donors. Uh, we hope you'll return for future events and we hope you'll support our work becoming a by becoming a member or making a donation. This evening, we have a great program with three leaders of three important cultural institutions in Boston. As we reflect on the past two years, it's important to remember what a shock the shutdown was to museums, libraries, and performance spaces. Initially, it was hard to understand the magnitude of what was happening. Uh, but as weeks turned into months, it became clear that cultural institutions faced real challenges. Uh, this was, it was two years of closed doors and reduced capacity, uh, fears for the health uh, of staff members as well as supporters, uh, hard fiscal choices, and anxiety about reopening to the public. Uh, we'll hear tonight from the leaders of the uh, Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, the New England Aquarium, and the Massachusetts Historical Society, three leading, although very different, uh, cultural institutions. Uh, Matthew Teitelbaum uh, is the Anne and Graham Gunn Director of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, a position he's held since 2015. Prior to taking the helm at the MFA, he was the Director and CEO of the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto. He is a scholar of contemporary European and Canadian art and holds a bachelor's degree in Canadian history from Carleton University, a master's in modern European painting and sculpture from Courtauld Institute of Art and an honorary doctorate of law from Queen's University. Uh, Rick Musil uh, is joining us in the place of Vicky Sprill, uh, who was called away on an unexpected obligation at the last minute. Mr. Musil is Vice President for External Relations at the New England Aquarium. Prior to his role at the Aquarium, he was a Senior Vice President at Citizens Bank. Uh, and before that, he worked on Beacon Hill uh, for a number of years, uh, including uh, quite some time for uh, Mass Senator Theresa Murray uh, and the Senate Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, Catherine Al Gore is the President of the Massachusetts Historical Society. Previously, she had been the Director of Education at the Huntington Library. Uh, and before that, a professor of history and, and UC presidential chair at the University of California at Riverside. She received her PhD from Yale University uh, and was appointed by President Obama to the James Madison Memorial Fellowship Foundation. She also serves on the board of directors of the National Women's History Museum and the executive board of the Organization of American Historians. So the format that we're gonna have uh, for the program this evening is that each of our speakers is gonna give uh, a brief five to eight minute uh, recounting of, of their institution uh, dealing with the COVID pandemic. Uh, and then we are going to have a moderated uh, conversation where I'll ask a few questions and then we'll open it up to the audience uh, as well as to our online audience. So um, I think we were going to start with uh, Matthew Teitelbaum kicking us off. That sounds like a reasonable plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm here. I suppose because I have a story to tell, uh, but I'm here in the first instance because of great respect for the society and the work that you do. And uh, a sister institution doing extraordinary things uh, in this really challenging moment. Um, I often talk at the museum and it's something that I feel deeply uh, that we must be an institution that honors the past, but reaches for the future. And you can't do one without the other. And I believe it's a public institution's responsibility to do both. Um, we have not been closed for two years. We've been closed, open, closed, <laughs> open. Uh, and we have been now for many months. Um, it has been a challenging time. 
but I'm going to pause and say also a rewarding time. Uh, it's been challenging financially. It's been challenging from a point of view of leadership in the cultural sense of bringing a staff, volunteers forward when you're not gathering, when you're anxious about a range of things, when there's uncertainty about how the future is going to be put back together. Um, it's a challenging time uh, because I think the question, the question is, what do institutions mean? Has come under the microscope in a way, maybe certainly not in my generation uh, before now. The opportunities are precisely both of those things. Uh, one is, um, how do you bring a culture back together? How do you bring people back to a sense of feeling that they're part of something special, that they can come together to make something for the future. Uh, my own view is that what the legacy of this moment will be uh, new ways of working together, different decision-making, a clear connection to what audiences need, so I'm an, I'm an audience-driven institution as deeply as I am an institution connected to research and scholarship. Um, but we will, out of this moment, be thinking much more carefully about how we serve the public good. We will. And um, uh, in relation to that, I believe one of the legacies of this moment partly because of staff activism, because of the way in which uh, the question of legacy is being uh, dealt with. Um, one of the legacies of this moment will be change decision-making. I think that we will find institutions much more, and I'm gonna say in a very healthy way, engaged with their audiences, engaged with expertise in their communities outside of their four walls. Uh, because we realize in this moment, and if you think about the pandemic, both in a real and figurative uh, sense, everything's connected. None of us were safe in the pandemic because we are all connected. And uh, so too with ideas. And ideas surely come out of expertise and scholarship and clarity of purpose but they also come out of creating forms for convening and sharing ideas. So I think that that's gonna be one of the legacies of this moment. I'm gonna say, I think it's a really good thing. I think it's gonna keep our institutions alive. We're involved in a lot of various initiatives, many initiatives that look at new forms of interpretation, new ways in which projects are being developed in collaboration with community leaders. And I believe it is a very uh, positive thing. I talk more to my colleagues outside of the MFA than I ever have before. Just have to say it. It's partly the joys of Zoom. Yes, there are some joys in Zoom. <laughs> uh, but it's also a sense that we are in it together and we want to problem solve together. So I have pretty regular, very regular conversations with national museum leaders and Boston art museum leaders. Um, and this has been very good because again, in this moment, and I say this positively, I think we've learned that our, our challenges aren't that unique. We are actually sort of dealing with the same issues. How do you motivate your staff? How do you bring volunteers along? How do you create narrative in your institutions that appeal to your audiences? And uh, again, I think one of the legacies of this moment is a greater degree of collaboration. And I think that's a very positive thing. I will say that, um, uh, that the financial challenges ahead of us uh, are great. None of us have resettled. We've balanced our budget all the way through because we've received extraordinary philanthropy. We are thinking about new ways of raising revenue and probably good things are going to come out of that. And probably good things are going to come out of uh, uh, increased philanthropy by 
appealing to people who are interested in institutions in a new way. But uh, it's going to be tough. And it's going to take a number of years to become healthy again. Uh, and we have to go slow. Um, we have lots of folks coming through the museum. Um, if you come, as maybe some of you do on the weekend, it feels quite busy. We're still not above about 60% of our attendance from pre-pandemic. So that tells you that even with this sense of um, invitation, it's not quite coming back uh, as quickly as we, we need. I will say one last thing. Uh, I think the museum is in Boston and public spaces in Boston have done an extraordinary job of creating safe spaces for the public to gather. At the very beginning, we said to each other, if one of us falters, we all falter. And we, if, if our public start losing, losing confidence in how we've created those safe spaces, then it'll affect all of us. And we've stayed together and we've done some really extraordinary things. And I think uh, my colleagues have done an extraordinary job in every institution. And it's been wonderful to be part of that. Thank you. Rick? Well, good evening. And um, Gavin and Catherine, thanks for having us, Matthew. Great to be with you. Um, you know, we find us ourselves in this kind of pivotal moment. And for us at the New England Aquarium, we find it's a great opportunity to start by re-educating people as to who we are and informing people of the breadth and depth of who we have been for the last um, 50 plus years. Um, we're an ocean conservation organization. Our mission is to have a vital and vibrant ocean for generations to come. Um, we do this in many ways and in many places across our institution, both um, at our Boston campus and our Quincy campus and around the globe. Um, we run a sustainability focused um, aquarium that welcomes edu uh, and educates visitors from all across the world um, about animals in the wild and their habitats and how we can protect them. Um, we can do this by ensuring that we have a place to call home on our downtown waterfront and making sure that, that uh, our home in the face of climate change um, is there for the next half century. Um, and so we're you know, being very vocal and advocating for a more robust solution to resiliency, inclusivity, and accessibility on our waterfront. Um, in our Quincy campus, people say, oh, hey, Quincy. Um, we have one of the largest sea turtle rescue facilities in all of the United States, right in the Quincy shipyard. Um, and it's an amazing facility with a great group of colleagues who are doing some really, really meaningful work. Um, in our research center, the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life, we conduct science, uh, scientific research that illuminates how through the ocean, humans are impacting species in their habitats and how we can make a difference in that, how we can work together to have a balance of the ocean and its uses with those that call it home. Um, additionally, we influence policies both in industry and in government to make sure that that, in, that ocean, our ocean stays safe, uh, as I mentioned, for future generations. As Matthew alluded to, um, there have been no short of odd and um, just historic challenges that we've faced over the last 24 months or so. Uh, we didn't know how long we were gonna be closed, how long we would stay open, how long we were going to be closed again. Um, but with that came a lot of opportunities. Um, as Matthew mentioned about reaching out to art institutions, there are four of us, we call ourselves the Fab Four, and basically outing us, um, that would meet regularly on a Wednesday morning call just to talk and lean in on one another. Um, I'm most... not in that group. <laughs> 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 Nor are we an art organization either. It's not because you're not fabulous. Um, uh, but in many cases, that was a great place for us to share 
and lean. Some of us had more colleagues on our teams than others. Some of us had different expertise than others. Some of us had different connections than others. Sometimes it was just good enough to be able to pick up the phone and say, hey, what, what just happened today? What does that government guidance need? What are you doing? How can we do this together? Um, what type of resources are you reaching out to? Who are your connections? Um, I have a donor that's not necessarily interested in some of the things that we're doing, but probably is interested in some of the work that you're doing. And so that collaboration um, certainly bonded us. We are um, leaner, I think, than we've ever been. Uh, in 2019, our operating budget was around 40. $4 million, it was half that the year after. We had 357 colleagues when we started uh, before the pandemic, we're now down to 213. And I have to stop and just give a shout out to the folks who are our colleagues in our Boston campus, out in the field doing scientific research in our home in Quincy. Um, we have thousands and thousands of animals in our care who knew nothing about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And they required feeding and checkups and operations. And so while we may have been close to the public per se, we really weren't close at all. Our colleagues were coming in through a lot of different means, driving public transportation that was still running and doing the jobs that they had been doing, doing the jobs well that they had been doing all along. Uh, it is a transformative time, I think, as Matthew alluded to, we will come out of this stronger than we've ever been, um, and certainly more hopeful um, as we look forward to the future. Thank you. Catherine? Yeah, um, first, welcome everybody here. Lovely to see your faces. Lovely to have you all out there in the world as well. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. Uh, the first thing I want to say is, you said something, Matthew, about the fact that in many ways the challenges we face are the same. So first, I just want to say ditto, ditto. So <laughs> everything they said, I have nothing original to add to that. Um, but I did think about this time you gave me, Gavin, and I wanted to talk a little bit about our staff and our board and where we are. And frankly, it's there's some good news there. So before I sound optimistic, I also just want to acknowledge that this was horrible. It was sad and frightening and full of despair and unhealthy and profound. Let me just say that. But then let me talk to you a little bit about sort of how we got through it. And we did pretty well as a staff as far as our morale uh, and our sanity. And that was a little bit of leadership, not just from the top, but all the way through the line of leaders, some of whom are in this room, and luck. So the first piece of luck is I, I work with a great group of people. And like a lot of these kinds of institutions, I have um, colleagues of long standing, been here for 20, 30, 40 years. And they love the MHS, they love the Historical Society, and they will do anything for it, which is good, because often we ask them to do everything for it. <laughs> so that's good. So I started out really lucky. Um, when I became a leader here in 2017, it was my first presidency, and I very definitely modeled my leadership style on the empathic leader. But what a challenge to be an empathic leader during this time. It really pushed me as well. I, I kept joking about how I was going to write like a Harvard Business School Journal article about this, but I, I probably I just I probably can't face it again. But it was really trying to to find these moments to be empathic. So, and of course, I've completely forgot any sense of time. But for many months, I just wrote to the team at the end of every single day some news, some good news, some thoughts, sometimes ridiculousness, just to keep in touch. And as you said about your colleagues, I got to know my colleagues in ways we're off on different floors that I didn't through happy hour on Friday and coffee every day and trivia, Zooming in and we sent stuff and we did this and we had something called Operation Cheerfulness. So in some ways, we really pulled together in our morale. Um, in spite of all these efforts, however, I would say that the greatest asset we had was luck and circumstance. We are not dependent on revenue the way that my sister and fellow institutions 
are. And so we do not have to make really hard decisions about personnel that I know other institutions, your institutions had terrible decisions. And so psychologically, I think for our staff, they're listening to their colleagues in, in museums and historical places and libraries all across the country. And they're hearing about pay cuts and they're hearing about people getting let go. We were holding fast. And then my board at the time led by Paul Salmon, he was my board chairman at the time, did something I consider just extraordinary. So in, as we were approaching, we're on the July fiscal year, we're in the budget season when this happened, we were on year two of a three to five year salary study that we had conducted, which was intended to bring everybody up to market in about three, three and a half years. So, you know, spring 2020, our big fundraiser, our gala, was not happening at Fairmont Copley. We didn't know what the fundraising, and we depend on philanthropy as, as Gavin so elegantly said, um, we didn't know what the philanthropic landscape is gonna look like because let's face it, we do very important work here, but we are not feeding people. We are not, you know, we're not saving lives in that way. We're making lives, but we're not saving lives. And, you know, the, the feeling was charity that the need was so great. So in this, moment of uncertainty, my board decided to keep with the salary survey and instituted that year's, you know, additions to the salary. And I just thought, and, and, and it was phrased to me by Paul Salmon, that it was really a moral issue, that they had made a commitment to the staff that they were going to do this, and they kept to that commitment. So I hope and think that the staff felt um, very well taken care of and, and very supported. Um, I have to say, just sort of echo the same way. One of the things the pandemic did for all kinds of things is it sped up stuff. So stuff that was gonna happen, stuff that you were thinking was gonna happen, it just got fast. And we became incredibly productive. Gavin, is, I hope we'll talk about our public programs at some point, but just the numbers of pages printed and published and programs and people in history day, it just all went up. And we had been in this discussion since I got here in 2017 about our mission and who we are and who we're serving and how we're serving these people. And diversity, equity, inclusion was always part of this discussion. It all just kind of accelerated. And right, so here we are, where are we right now? We are struggling to live up to the productivity we set <laughs> here. Um, we definitely need new team members to do that. But our sense of mission of our um, place in this world to make this world a better place, I think has never been more heightened. So I think we're coming out of it with that. And all of which say it was still a horrible moment in humanity, but there it is. Opportunity. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and it was, we are very rapidly approaching a 1 million death total for the United States. That is just extraordinary. Just shocking. And uh, one out of four residents of Massachusetts has had COVID. Yeah. It's just like, that's just breathtaking. That's just, yes, yes. Um, so I have a, a number of questions. Um, some of these are sort of more focused sort of towards a particular person and some are just more general. Um, so all three uh, institutions close to the public uh, over the past two years, this meant different things to different institutions and in within each institution, it meant different things to different staff members. Um, for some, there were layoffs, for some there were furloughs, uh, others had to learn to work from home, uh, others had to learn all sorts of new skills as their jobs were redefined. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, this also really had an impact on feelings of equity within institutions. Um, and I know uh, Rick mentioned that you know, there are turtles that needed to be fed and there were fish that needed to be checked on. Um, can you talk a little bit about how uh, there is a feeling of a, of a change in senses of equity within your institution uh, and how you've been thinking about addressing that. And that can be for everyone because it also, of course, would involve not just people feeding turtles, but people who had radically changed jobs or, or yeah. colleagues who were no longer there. I think given the diversity of the types of roles that our institutions have, there are natural feelings of equity that arise um, in, in any circumstance, not the least of which during a global pandemic. Um, and certainly they did for us as well. Um, you know, folks had to report to Quincy and had to report to 
um, our home on Central Wharf as well to care for the thousands of animals that call us home. Um, and so we doubled down and um, did a whole lot of listening. Um, we made some changes to various policies. We upped parking stipends and tea stipends and things like that to try to lessen the burden on those colleagues. Um, and that commitment's gonna continue. It won't stop as God willing, the pandemic subsides a little bit. That's work that we're gonna continue to do. But uh, uh, I was mentioning earlier all day um, staff meeting yesterday, which was the first time that we had met as a group probably in two, two and a half years. Um, and we launched our culture action plan. Um, so we're taking kind of the things that we heard and we learned and looking at ways that we can address them and uh, both for the short term and the long term. Um, so that those learned experiences will guide us um, going forward. Uh, so, you know, we live in a moment in which institutions and the authority of institutions are being deeply questioned. Some of that's good, and there's a lot that isn't so good. Um, so the notion of equity, I mean, we live in a, in a moment when there are forces that believe museums should be taken apart and then put back together again, or just taken apart and disassembled or run by the staff and not by leaders. And, you know, there's a lot that's out there around the notion of the institution. So in one sense, uh, when I acknowledge that I think decision-making is shifting an institution, right it in, that's my response to the question of, institutional authority, which I think, you know, part of me thinks should be questioned, frankly. Certainly our history of collecting should be questioned and our uh, uh, commitment to ethic, consistently ethical behavior should be strengthened, all of that. Um, but there, there are certain kinds of inequities that by nature of our organizations, certainly in my case, and I think in yours, will always be there. It goes as follows. Some people work at the museum and they interact with the public. And some people work at the museum and don't. So when you say you can work from home, some people on the museum staff can't work from home. And they are the ones who are put in harm's way more than the people who can work from home. So what I think is positive out of this moment around this issue of equity inequity because there are circumstances in our museums that can't be reset is that I do think that the way that you create the sense of moving forward together the equity but engagement is to be and to articulate why you're doing certain things engage people in that journey assure them they have a part in that journey regardless of what their contribution might be. And I think that, again, this is a positive thing. I think that, um, you know, I often think, and now I'm saying it more, uh, that the question isn't what we do, it's why we do it. And I think you can only be successful in articulating why we do what we do as institutions if you root it in the mission of the institution and the values of your leadership. You do that consistently enough, you can deal with some of these structural inequities. Um, we've raised compensation levels uh, enough. Uh, we're being thoughtful about that. <clears throat> but uh, uh, we're instituting a number of ways of working around hiring, uh, around racial equity and gender equity, um, which I'm proud of. Uh, I can assure you, it work will never be done. Okay. There's a lot of work. To and it's, I'm finding it harder. So actually, when we were mostly closed, we actually opened internally uh, to ourselves um, because our version of that, we have that too. So we have shop where, you know, and what we have editors who, don't have to, you know, sh show up ever. They do, but they don't have to. And then we have people who work with the collections. They have to be here to work with the collections. But we started, you know, uh, and we we started doing lots of work in, in internally. 
but that was the easy part. You know, we've got live chat with the, the librarian, you know, we do images. That was the easy part. The part that's hard that where the inequities you're talking about show is when in the changing shift about the vaccines, the presence of vaccines, then the mandate, and then the, uh, so we have a vaccine mandate, you have to have a vaccine, you have to be optimally protected, whatever that is in, in the moment, and you have to submit that for verification. We have very strict masking, um, which we still have more strict masking during the day than, than might be reflected by this table. <laughs> um, and that's where the that's where the rub really happened. So the, the fact that yes, during two years, we had people who worked from remotely the whole time and some people who had to come in and they did have to go on the tee and they were interacting with each other, but we felt like we had that. We, had, we, we could ensure the safety within the walls. Again, the tee, no, but within the walls, we could ensure your safety had to come to work, you had to work with a collection, but you could be masked, you could be separated. Our beautiful building has lots of airy rooms, so that was fine. The difficulty in, in trying to balance people's anxiety and fear and to be truly equitable and work out the values you're talking about, Matthew, now is much more tricky because we have concerns about masking and what we, what we can ask outsiders to do because now the outsider's coming in. And I'm, 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 I appreciate what you're saying, but I found it comparatively easy to keep everybody safe all at once. That was kind of the easy part. The, this part is much harder. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I think that's true. Well, to turn to a slightly more positive. I'm oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I took, I took a dark turn there, Kevin. Um, so lack of access to cultural sites uh, created all sorts of problems, but also it creates opportunities. Um, there were all sorts of virtual programs that began, and Catherine, you, you mentioned a little bit about how things sort of went sort of into hyperdrive. And, you know, we had always sort of wanted to have an online programming presence, and then we either did or we had nothing. <laughs> and it was like sink or swim, figure it out fast. Um, and so um, that was that was great in some ways. Uh, on the flip side, um, this force and distance that meant that people weren't actually experiencing the spaces. So I sort of wonder what you think about what things you learned in terms of virtual vir virtual adaptations that you're going to keep and what things you sort of miss by adapting to a virtual space. And that can be for anyone. Oh my God. Well, <laughs> I, I, I mean, just give a sense of like you, I remember you and Sarah Petrulli, that was Sarah at the time, you s turned on a dime and we had Zoom programming uh, like so right away. And we were used to having all you lovely people here, maybe 20 or 30 of you at a time. And Gavin was coming to me and saying, we have 500 people signed up for this program. <laughs> and we became very adept at, you know, it's not just the people that sign up or the people who actually come on, but whether they stay. So, I mean, obviously we're struggling with that, but, um, you know, and you're getting some of the benefit of it, but uh, I think, we're, I think we're, we'll never go backwards. I mean, we'll never, I, I had to go, I broke, I was telling this trick, I broke my uh, travel quarantine uh, last couple of weeks. I went to Atlanta, Georgia, and I went to uh, Dallas. And while I was in Georgia, I had a, a moment with, this is maybe a slight, slight tangent, but I felt like I was in two worlds. So um, from my hotel room in Georgia, I participated in a program for GBH. Um, so I'm in Georgia, program for GBH, and my uh, interlocutor was in Alaska. It was very, very early, right? And 600 people had signed up for this. We only got like 350, but 600 the next like later that day i walked into a ballroom with 300 people so this but i was reflecting on here i was in georgia doing this program this is something we would have never imagined we could do two years ago and then i walked into this ballroom and i thought we could not have imagined doing this two months ago so i just think that's a great illustration of sort of where we are with one foot in one foot out i mean but but i think it's just an unabashed good as long as we can be open and give people a chance to be here. Um, it's just an unabashed good. Yeah, and a lot of great learned experiences. You know, for us, we similarly pivoted on a dime because you had to. 
Um, and it was a great opportunity to say, okay, listen, you know, if we can't have guests on site, what else can we do? And so we similarly pivoted um, with many of our querists and our science and research folks who on many occasions were accustomed to being behind the scenes. Um, and all of a sudden they were social media stars. Mm -hmm. oh, and, and that yes. was really cool. Um, and thanks to our, our really dedicated and passionate um, marketing and communications team who rushed in and got it all together. We were doing um, programming at 11 o'clock every day, um, every weekday, and just talking about the different collections. And so while you weren't able to be with us, you were with us. And we were able to educate and inspire as you would if you were coming to our property. And that was a and really- And you picked really, cute animals. And we had amazing Come animals. On. Amazing <laughs> animals. Um, and it was great to see these colleagues rally in such a way. And it was fun and it was silly sometimes. Um, and the, you know, you're literally reaching out to thousands of people in this new way that we were all kind of trying to figure out what was going on in the world. Are we going to be closed for a week? Are we going to be closed for many weeks? Um, there was so much, you know, great unknown. And here are these folks, these amazing professionals who in many cases didn't, weren't accustomed to doing what they were doing and they jump into action and they, Love that. they were social media stars. It was wonderful. I can't tell you the amount of folks that we've heard from saying, oh, thank you. At 11 o'clock every weekday, I know I can plunk my kid down. <laughs> and they're going to learn and they're going to be educated and they're going to be inspired about the things that they would have come to expect from the New England Aquarium had they been on site. And that was a really beautiful thing. To see our colleagues in action, they were just quite resilient. And that was a beautiful, beautiful Oh, that's thing. great. So I'll give you one qualification to that, however. <laughs> um, although I do think that this moment has made our institutions bigger. So for example, in the MFA, we've had a lot of online programs where we're talking about works of art that aren't on the wall. And Curie is actually talking about things in the vaults and in Zambra. And that's actually pretty cool because it excites folks. And, right? and we also, of course, engage with expertise. So we're in conversations online and engaging people who otherwise aren't part of our world and it's easy to get to them as you say Atlanta this and Boston that and you know all these connections we can make on our, our research base. Um, here's the but. The but is that if you take that to its logical conclusion, we should close our doors and we should say that the experience of the work of art secondary to what we do online, because what is online is so good. I know that's not what you're saying. It's a trap for all of us, because none of us who have invested in online programming have recouped our investment. Oh, except, yeah. Yeah. except in sustaining philanthropy, but other than that, keeping people close. But in terms of actual for-profit programming, not, nobody has done that, okay? I just want to be clear. Like, the Metropolitan, the Tate, the whatever, whoever is doing really good work online, and a lot of them are like really good, it's not financially viable on a direct uh, expense versus revenue basis. So you do it for other reasons, and then you have to remember that you do it in part to keep people close enough because you want them to come to your museum. You right. want them to experience, and getting that balance is going to take a little while to get right. I know, but I want to be optimistic, though, because I think <laughs> that we, uh, and this is where we have, we have some art, we have some art around, uh, but we have documents. People love the real thing. And I remember when, like, this internet thing started coming around, and there was a prediction in the 90s that there was going to be a time when we would have museum tours via the computer. And of course that turned out to be true, but um, people really do want to see the, the real thing. And in some ways that availability of, of that online experience, I think has increased that, um, that desire. And I'm thinking now it's probably several years very, I think it was a Folger Shakespeare library at one point before the pandemic was sent around a folio and they sent it all around America to small towns. And first, I think a folio is pretty esoteric-ish kind of thing, right? People 
lined up to see this thing, this real thing. And, you know, I saw the pictures, the selfies with the baby's first folio, you know, right. Um, so I, I think that people, you know, and, and they love the online program. They would always say, but we wish we could come in. We wish we could see the real thing. I think for us, it kept You're the- giving me a jaundice diet. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think for us, it kept the wonder and, and uh, excitement alive. You know, there's nothing like coming to visit our shark and ray touch tank. Social media can um, speak to that, can't get you there. Um, and you I think. One of those at the MFA. <laughs> shark and ray touch tank. You got an extra one? <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, and I think, you know, it was also a tool for us to talk to various constituencies, funders, government, um, foundations to say, hey, you know, yes, we may be closed to the public, though we're not closed because of the type of facility and, and ocean conservation organization we are. Um, I also think it did something for our colleagues during this period as well to keep us together, even though we were six feet apart. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to remember that we were six feet apart uh, for so long, but, uh, and that was a beautiful thing as well. Yeah. And so uh, it was good for those of us in my group in external relations, where we talked to government, we talked to corporations, we talked to community organizations. Um, it was a service that we could provide in a time that was difficult for us mm -hmm. and gave them a little bit of hope um, and excitement, an opportunity, perhaps respite if you were a, uh, a parent or custodian of youngins who wanted to spend a couple of um, minutes with us to learn about the Shark and Ray Touch Tank, which you will not find at the Museum of Fine Arts. Any of a shark. So it's it's um, it was nice to see our colleagues in that way. Yeah. I can say just recently we had a program where it was actually run as a, a meeting rather than a webinar. And so people could actually con contribute. And a person wrote in and said, uh, I'm, at, I'm uh, in writing from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, it's 9.30 in the morning and I'm at my job, but I keep cracking up and looking at the, at the monitor and I'm trying to pretend like I'm working. And somebody else wrote in and said, uh, I'm in Italy, it's 11 o'clock here. Uh, and somebody else said, hello from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and it was like, that was amazing. But no one in Rio de, Rio de Janeiro is gonna send <laughs> like, It's not gonna happen. Uh, so it's like, it is amazing to have those connections and have those global yeah. connections. And our programs have been viewed on six continents. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's not gonna about translate the into money. I don't um, wanna put you people out there in an uncomfortable <laughs> position. <laughs> We've had thousands of people, and and no, we haven't seen a big uptick in memberships or donations. Uh, yeah, so I think your point is very but well taken. But it might have, you see, back to the notion of mission leadership, it right. might have really strengthened your staff culture because people are feeling that they're producing content that's valuable to folks. So Absolutely. it's not necessarily a straight line, and I don't mean to say it that, but it, it is going to be a challenge for us to, to really figure out longer, longer term. But, you know, I had an experience recently, which is not disconnected to this, which is what is the content that people want, right? So there's this, I haven't done one yet, but there are all these big Van Gogh and-, and Oh, the immersive films, yeah, yeah. And I was asked by the, by the uh, art critic for the Globe what I thought of them. And I said, it's too early to actually say. And, you know, for me to say as a museum leader, no way. When I'm in the back of my head thinking, I would take one room of something to do with Egypt. I would take one room. I wouldn't take 10 rooms. Right. But I'd take one because I think it could actually deepen an experience of, and I think of the, of the objects we hold in trust. So I do think this online, I'm making a, a, a facile connection, but this online immersive, all of this stuff that goes around the original object could be used us. We just have to figure out how to do it. And I feel the same about online program. It's, it's entirely uh, positive in terms of building audience. The question is, how do we use it to create, um, you know, which is to me the essential purpose of the museum, which is to gather people with purpose.
mm-hmm. and gather people with purpose, which is about engaging with content. Mm-hmm. I think we have time for one more question from me, then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, so uh, the response of government agencies over the past two years was often quite inconsistent. Um, well, there's plenty to say about that. Uh, one interesting thing about the crisis is it was uh, real money sent to cultural institutions um, to help soften the economic impact, um, which in the past hasn't always been true, economic downturns. Mm-hmm. Uh, often cultural institutions have sort of been left out. Um, can you reflect a little bit on how the state and national government helped manage the, this crisis for your museum or your institution? And that goes to anyone. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just be quick so we can get to audiences. But we had got, we were so lucky and got a PPP loan, and that made a huge difference. Very grateful. I would say the, the people I really worry about are, I'm going to say the arts, like the performing arts mm-hmm. and theaters. I think that we're, we were probably pretty lucky. I'm just guessing. Uh, we were similarly lucky uh, through Senator Markey and Senator Warren's office, working with Senator Schumer's office on the Shuttered Benadryl Operator Grant Program, which we received the maximal, uh, maximum allowable amount under that grant program. We did receive a PPP, um, and it has been forgiven, so that was, a, in essence, a grant, uh, which was also huge. Um, I have to say a big shout-out to uh, our state representative, Aaron Michaelwitz, um, then Senator Joe Boncori, um, the leadership in the legislature who has been very, very supportive of us, both on the operating and the capital side, which is historic for us as an institution. Um, uh, Government really rallied. Um, We were very fortunate to be in a position where, um, like I said, even though we were close, we we were not. And so uh, government was a big lifeline for us to get through this. I think we had got one of the largest grants for an institution that doesn't have sharks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, listen, I think it was extraordinary uh, what happened. And it was inconsistent and there were holes. And, you know, we, we couldn't get into PPP because we were too big at that point. Uh, we did get shuttered venue. I, I think, and, and by the way, our staff who we had to furlough, we could only furlough, we, you know, we could furlough them because of the government subsidy uh, that, that truly allowed us, everybody at their at their compensation level, truly did. We we didn't furlough uh, anybody uh, that couldn't. Um, so I don't for a moment say that something inconsequential happened. Something really consequential happened. Huge difference. Um, do we have a question from the audience, the in person audience, or uh, Olivia? If you have any questions from the online audience. Sure. Um, Sarah asked um, if you had to deal with any COVID outbreaks among your staff employees. Well, that's that's a very kind question. We were very, well, I'm going to say, well, we were very lucky and we worked really hard that we did not have have any kind of outbreaks. Uh, And I have to say, too, um, I... My colleagues in our senior staff pulled together what we call the phased reopening team is very optimistic. And every week, these professionals got together and figured stuff out, including systems. And we had a three week rotation system and then a two week rotation system. And we had it, it, you know, they figured this stuff out there. Nobody's a public policy expert. Nobody's a scientist, epidemiologist or so not an HR professional. But this team of, of people, and this is across the institution, actually not just senior staff, but up below the line as well, really got together and, and tried to figure all of this out for us. And they did a good job because we did not have, we had a sporadic scares here and there, but not an outbreak. Yeah, we were similarly fortunate in that regard. I mean, we are a science-based organization. So our folks have a certain uh, frame of mind mm-hmm. when we go into situations like this. Um, and I have to give a great um, acknowledgement to our visitor experience staff. Um, you know, when we first opened, af- we opened after the first closure, um, you know, keeping six people six feet apart, making sure that folks had masks on. That's a tough thing to do when you're a visitor services, visitor experience um, colleague. And they did a really, really great job. There was no, there were no known transmissions amongst our guests. So we were, um, 
we're, we are grateful to them who were the front lines to dealing with the public through all of it. And I, I, I say the same. Uh, I think we worked pretty hard at it as public institutions. Internet, we also work pretty hard at it, and I admire the whole sector for the work that we that we did collectively and individually. Um, we have our first public health and safety officer, Maggie Scott, um, uh, which is a, something that's come out of this moment. She was terrific in how she set systems up, talking to colleagues all the time. We had some challenges with um, contractors who weren't bound by the same, and we had three construction projects going on mm -hmm. while we were closed. We had to watch that, we had a couple of moments. Um, until recently, we had, I think, two staff members. Now we have more because this last Omicron got to us, but we have no evidence of uh, spread between staff at the MFA. No. That's great. So, uh, so they have kids, they have grandparents, whatever. Uh, but nothing got out of hand and nothing is out of hand. Now we are doing pool testing every week and um, we feel pretty good about what's happening. Uh, <laughs> um, so more along the lines of a testimonial as a, as a community person, I live in this neighborhood and uh, we, my wife and I moved here in December 2019. <laughs> we had three months in Boston, <laughs> and we've been under house arrest ever since. Um, but the museum of Mount Rainer was, was, I grew up in Manhattan, and so I grew up with a million museums. I was so thrilled that we retired and we moved to Boston. <laughs> 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 but uh, but uh, the, three, the three months were terrific. <laughs> Museum right away, I'm starting to take courses. It's a very good tour. You can possibly do a three to the day. And then, and so, Director uh, uh, Tidelbaum opened in September of 2020, and I was first online, and he was there greeting everyone in the steps of the museum. And I felt very comfortable. It was fabulous to be, say, the American being, with the Gilbert Silver from Washington, and there's nobody there. <laughs> it was like 10 minutes to go by before something to show up. So that was okay. But I've been taking, I've taken eight courses since, and I don't think it's terrific. I'm going to try. I'll come here and knock the roof. He is a painting of sharks. We actually have the real time. <laughs> Just reiterating what he said. <laughs> I love the top of shark. It's just fabulous. And oh, the accounts of the shipwreck we have. <laughs> Get in on it, Peter. What's great about our sector is that we're not competitive. Yeah. <laughs> Truth be told, I mean, the, the, there it, there are so many great opportunities that have come from this, and 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 Matthew mentioned his colleague Maggie, who uh, on a dime I could call text. Um, we're former colleagues in government, so we kind of have the same um, brain, same wired brain about trying to understand what government did or didn't do or how to react to what it was going to do. Um, and that's a great thing to have those colleagues to lean in on. And I will remember that for the, the rest of my professional career, that there were people like Maggie and others in the um, sector who um, you could lean in on. And that was, that was a great thing. Yes. Um, I was gonna sort of look at it from a different perspective and that is, Instead of reflecting on what has occurred in the past, how do you reflect going forward? Because it seems there's a lot of things one can build upon based on what you've learned. And I can just speak from my own perspective as a patron. Um, I've become involved in organizations all around the country that I never would have, you know, I'm not going to fly down to Philadelphia for one hour of event. And yet, when you do it through Zoom, and that gets you involved in the organization, and interested in what they're doing, and perhaps interested in pursuing it further. And somebody had mentioned, I mean, just two of them, that in my own area, interested interest in history, Monticello and um, Montpelier, both have quite a, you know, extensive programs that, you know, I've actually participated in. And, you know, I think that's something one can build upon going forward. 
I was in a staff or a meeting with a staff member from Monticello this morning. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that I think that question of access. Now it does give me a little chill sometimes. A major patron of the museum said to me, "You know, I just had cocktails at the Frick, and it was, you know, five. Do you do it? Five o'clock on a Friday, and it's twenty minutes, and you get a." drink that relates to the painting and I think oh my god I'm gonna lose her you know like, so I'm just like, <laughs> yes how do I compete with that so but we do hear great ideas and it's wonderful that you feel connected to institutions that aren't in your community and I think that is one of the very positive things that are coming out of this moment and a sense that of connect of, you know a thread that connects us and and I want to say when you talk about thinking about moving forward, and I know this is exactly what you meant, but I think what's also exciting too when we have our conversations every week uh, as senior staff is the world of work and what work and health mean. Um, so, for instance, this week we were talking about how we hope that we are now past the world where you come to work sick, like a brave little soldier. And your boss sees you sitting there at the desk and you're miserable and sniffly. And, but you're there, damn it, you're there. <laughs> and it's sort of like, now we have learned, we do not want you here. We love you very much, go, you leave now, right? Don't even come to work. So this new world of work, how it's gonna, we're gonna help people find balance in their life. How is it gonna nurture people and families? Um, I'm, I find that it really exciting, and that's one of those things. I read something in the paper the other day where apparently people were talking about this before. I wasn't aware of it, but this has sped this up. So the idea of working from home, which at the Historical Society, no one worked remotely. No one no. until the pandemic. Now everybody who can work remotely is set up to do it, but we wouldn't have dreamed of making that kind of shift. We wouldn't have dreamed of it. Yeah. So the world of work idea is very exciting to me. Yeah. I think for us, you know, we accomplished a lot during the pandemic. We had so many, so many great successes. I mean, we had started a campaign to advocate for a more inclusive and resilient uh, and accessible waterfront right before the pandemic hit. We had rallied people at a big meeting and people showed up and the fire marshal shut down the room and we thought, oh, this is amazing. Everyone's so excited. And then the pandemic came about, oh, all that momentum is gone. And here we are with a mayoral administration who gets that resiliency is a district and harbor wide thing. That isn't something we have to address in five years or 10 plans later. It is here. It is now. Um, and it's got to be inclusive. It's got to be done through an equity lens. And uh, I think that momentum is greater than ever. And so I'm really excited about that. I, I thought we had this meeting and it was great. It was so well attended. It was one of the first things I did when I worked at the program. I thought, yes. And then the pandemic hit and I thought, oh, wow. But it's never been stronger. And so I think the city will be better for that. And I'm really, really excited about the future, the immediate future of what we're going to do there. That's great. Yeah. Uh, Olivia, do we have any questions from the audience? Or we could have uh, clearly one from the audience. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question here too. Hello. <laughs> I, I um, am with the Boston Women's Heritage Trail, and you know what we were all excited about 2020, you know, celebrating women's suffrage. We had brochures printed and we were going to do a march and everything, and then closed down. But what happened is some of our board members started doing online walks. PowerPoint, we did uh, 80 people last night at the JP Library, um, several other places, a law firm got us to come you know, in and uh, do a program. And so there have been some really positive things in terms of you know, being at home. And I was, at, I was with you in the um, Wherever you were, and I asked the SES, the GBH, yeah. 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 And it was great. I mean, you know, sitting there in my Levi's and watching what's going on. And it did help um, in terms of numbers, getting people to know who we, we are. Yeah. 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 So it was positive. And we'll definitely go back to more, you know, walking trails. Come walk along the harbor. 
<laughs> yeah. We luckily did our suffrage exhibition in 2019. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, all three of your respective institutions, they, they play a big part in making Boston the travel destination that it is. And I'm just curious to get your thoughts as to once the crowds return from New England or farther from that all over the world, really. Do you anticipate any changes? Are you, are you planning any changes? Um, do you kind of fundamentally see just the, them being the same tourist attractions that they always have been? So. I have two on that one, if I can jump in. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. One is that I think we saw by mitigating the number of visitors in the building at one time, it created a different experience. And so we will do that going forward. Oh, that's um, great. And I think that is a very awesome learned experience. So I'm really, really excited about that. Two is I think we're going to continue to be a better communicator about, you know, I think we've been good about communicating when it comes to the work we do as an ocean conservation organization. And we are now a better communicator about the economic impact that the New England Aquarium has on the city of Boston and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We just um, did a study with Tufts that um, now estimates that the uh, ripple economic impact on the city and the state from having an aquarium in your downtown is roughly around $269 million a year. That is a pre-pandemic year, so I will add that asterisk, mm -hmm. but that is an, an exciting, important point to point out to others. When we talk about us being an ocean conservation organization and uh, the economic ripple that we have, that feels like the Grammy music. <laughs> <laughs> The time is up. Here's the music. <laughs> <laughs> Till the right time. There's a lot of clocks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I will just say very quickly, we're getting ready for something exciting. So 2026, 20, 2025, we're getting ready for the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution, of the events leading up and the American Revolution itself. So we are going to own 2025. <laughs> own it here. Good evening. Good evening. I don't know the answer to tourism. I think it's a big question for all of us. I don't know what the new landscape is going to look like, but um, uh, we're watching, analyzing. Nothing, nothing I can say that would be particularly useful, but it is a, it's a big issue for all of us. Um, a lot of it has to do with leadership at the polit political level. You know, I've not yet had a successful conversation myself with an elected politician around the need to invest more in, tour in a tourism strategy. So maybe that'll come with a new mayor or a new governor or something like that. Well, thank you all. This has been a wonderful thank conversation. You. Thank you all.